Hello and welcome to From the Rookery End. A, a Merry Christmas. Uh, it is our Christmas special. Um, this wasn't going to be a special, but it's sort of, sort of growing a little bit, uh, this podcast. As you would have seen from the title, it's all about one special man, one Hyder Helgerson. My name is John. Uh, with me is Michael. Merry Christmas, Michael. He gets the ball, he scores a goal, he gets the ball, he scores a goal, he scores a goal, go, go, hide, 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 Helgerson. Merry Christmas. I don't yeah. know, I don't know what to say, uh, Merry Christmas in Icelandic, so uh, yeah, <laughs> just... Uh, Oh, I nearly said Merry Happy Returns there. That definitely doesn't work. <laughs> I thought you were going to, that was your version of A Christmas Carol, but no, it's just a Heide Helgerson chant, of course. And uh, Merry Christmas to you, Jason. Merry Christmas, John and everyone. I'm not going to sing, but it, it feels quite appropriate that we're, <laughs> we, we're doing a Christmas episode for the man from Iceland. Yes, we are. Now, here's the thing, and I'm going to give this to Jason first. He wasn't the first Icelandic player to play for Watford. Do you know who was, Jason? Was it Johan Goodmanson? It was Johan Goodmanson. Oh. I, I, you know, there was. A, I, I had a feeling that yeah, you'd get that instantly, Jason, because it's all too much uh, information stored in your brain. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, he was. But yeah, but nowhere near the impact of what Hyder made. And we actually started, and you'll 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 know we're going to talk about him. But we also interviewed him. Uh, or I interviewed him a few weeks ago, and it was uh, I, I, there were very few. You know, we've interviewed not everybody, Mike, but we've interviewed a lot of former Watford players. But he was sort of this special person that I never thought we would get to interview. And it was great when we got the, I got the opportunity to do it. We've been really, really lucky with From the Rookery End to, to interview a lot of people in, involved in Watford. But there's, there's somehow there's some who seem like magical and untouchable, if that, if that makes sense. A hider's one, he just seems to be sort of, and I, I suppose, befitting of his uh, Icelandic roots. He sort of seems quite mythical doesn't he yeah. and to be able to sort of to track him down um and to be able to, to to speak to him is really it feels quite special it feels really special and especially because of the high regard in which I certainly hold Heide Helgerson and I know pretty much every every Watford supporter who is lucky enough to see him in the yellow will as as well it just yeah it's got that little sprinkling of of magic about it I think yeah, and you will hear from the interview, he does have a, a speech impediment. Um, and I think maybe that's why we haven't heard from him as much. Uh, yeah. He doesn't do as many interviews. I, I literally couldn't find an interview with him anywhere. There might be one somewhere. I haven't been able to find it. But it was, it was great to sort of hear from him. And you'll hear the, the, the interview that I did. And we'll also speak to Sir Nigel Gibbs, of course, a man who not only was a Watford player when Hyder turned up, he also was part of the coaching staff throughout Hyder's time. So we want to get the inside track on what he was like. So we also speak to Sir Nigel Gibbs. But, but your, your, your memories of him, Jason, especially early on, let's say that, at least that first, and we'll talk about his return, of course. But in that first stint, you know, we, we were in the Premier League. We were struggling. Tommy, Smith was, uh, Tommy Mooney was uh, injured. And we were, you know, coming off the back of two fantastic promotions. For you, uh, you know, you as a Watford fan at that point and watching him, what did he mean to you when he turned up at Watford? Well, when he turned up, it was um, a, a record signing, wasn't it? And yeah. it, it seems funny these days to say it, but one and a half million pounds, that at the time was uh, was the most we'd ever spent on a player. So there's a lot of anticipation. I think we were, or well, certainly I was realistic enough to, to know that he was unlikely to be uh, sort of the, the golden shot that was going to save us from relegation. But there was still this sort of sense of anticipation. Watford have spent over a million pounds on a player. And that first game when he came in, he certainly didn't disappoint that <laughs> that goal he scored against Liverpool, that header. When, you, when you're struggling, when your team's down at the bottom, you're looking for little glimpses of magic across the season to get your enjoyment out of football. And that was, uh, that was certainly one of them. And it sort of set the tone for him as well. It was that... He's one of these players that would sort of get get in the mix. He 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 had a great leap on him. He'd, he'd get his head in anything. He'd be challenging goalkeepers. No no sort of fear. No standing back. And sort of to hell with the consequences of, uh, <laughs> of the goalkeeper. And yeah, yes. it's almost as if the, the goalkeeper or the defender marking him wasn't there. He didn't care. He'd go in, and, and more often than not, that would get us goals that maybe other strikers wouldn't get. So yeah, he, he set the tone with it in those early days. Yeah, that first goal really does. It didn't just set the tone. It sort of it almost summed up his his entire career. And we knew what we were getting 
at that stage, that first I like, goal I, against... I can imagine, though, Mike, at that point, because he's Haider and he got a header. Everyone went, <laughs> Haider got a header. I wonder if he'll score a few more of those. <laughs> That's yes. definitely what you did, John, <laughs> isn't it? But I, I, re- well, I remember I'll admit, when... I'll admit, actually, when he first joined up, I wasn't a heavy Watford fan at that point because I was at university and I didn't get to as many games. And his first stint, of course, I watched, I saw, but I don't think I necessarily saw the full detail. So I didn't see that game, that first game. But everyone just fell in love with him instantly. Yeah, it was. he just sort of... It was full ball. He was just. He just gave everything to to get to the ball and he obviously didn't care which part of his body connected with the ball as long as something did and it, and it ended up in in the net and it's that 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 full-blooded nature um that full-blooded performance that, that absolute determination to to win the ball resulted in that a Premier League uh, debut goal which as we'll hear later is is undoubtedly an absolute dream for him um and just, I remember when we signed him, and as Jay says, 1.5 million. It was a lot of money back then, certainly for Watford. And I think we knew that we weren't going to be spending lots of money. We we recognised that that Premier League season was going to be very, very difficult. It's even though we were we were on the, off the back of those two straight promotions and all the fun and games that 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 brought with it. We did, I think, deep down know that it was going to be going to be very difficult, but. There was that little flicker when we did sign him for a million and a half, and then when you, when you saw him, it's like when because if you imagine sort of right, you're thinking Icelandic striker. You're thinking, look, I'm not going to beat around the bush. You're thinking like Thor, aren't you? You're thinking <laughs> six foot two, Boromir or whatever his hammer is called in his hand. You know, or in modern days, let's let's give it a little bit of football. You're thinking sort of Erling Haaland type stature, big old boy come in, and he wasn't actually. That big was he? He's, he's certainly. I think he's probably under under six foot. And you think when you first see him, you think, "Oh right, he, he's sort of he's stocky. He's really built, and he obviously means business." But he's not necessarily. If you close your eyes and imagine an, an Icelandic striker, he's probably not necessarily what you what you expected. But but straight away into the fray, massive impact. And in terms of cementing his status with with Watford supporters and getting their buy-in getting their support that was it happened from from minute one and that's and I think the fact that it was despite it happened the fact that it happened despite us ultimately getting relegated we still have super fond memories from from Heide Helgerson in that that initial season I think that that says it all about the the relationship that he quickly forged and went on to have with with us as Watford supporters just to correct you Mike I know we don't get a lot of people complaining about things that we say and stuff on this podcast um it's Milner is the uh, Thor's uh, hammer what, I have a what's, feel- Bora- what's Bor- Boromir then that I said I reckon he I was Lord of the Rings yeah, maybe. I maybe don't I don't know. Uh, but, well, uh, you did, you're absolutely right to to, <laughs> to correct us because, um, yeah, we don't. Yeah, we won't, we'll get a bursting mailbag, no doubt about, about that. <laughs> Probably from Hyder himself, in fact. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Uh, Jason, though, that, let's talk. You know, the, the, the sort of onwards after that season. You know, it was the the the, the uh, you know the ability to jump like a salmon, the ability to run and run and run and work really hard that we we, we fell in love with. But in terms of his place. Over those what five and a half seasons he was with us, he had, you know, so one and a half with Graham, then he had with Viali, and the rest of it was pretty much with, apart from the very end, it was with with Ray Lewington or Ray Lou as he's mm-hmm. called. You know, how did you sort of see his place, and in, in those those teams which were not successful necessarily had some good cut runs, but mm. we knew there was a limitation purely because of finances apart from the hoopla season uh, with Viali, where it all started, well, it all went badly wrong. Where did you sort of see him and how did you sort of see his role in the in the club? Yeah, it's funny how your mind plays and your memory plays tricks on you, isn't it? Because you think about those two cup runs, the FA Cup run and the League Cup run, and Haider very much felt part of that. And weirdly, one of my, I suppose it is a Haider memory, he scored the uh, the winning goal in that, that 1-0 win over West Brom in the FA Cup run didn't he at home mm. my works party was that day in london so i couldn't go but me and my other half and a few other work colleagues all watford fans were watching sky sports saturday in a pub um in central london somewhere uh, and when sky sports went to the the game for the goal there was a, a small eruption 
there was a little bit of Hertford cheer in, uh, in, the, in the pub in central London. And that, mm. and that sort of stuck with me to this day. And, and, and I've obviously watched the goal back uh, on, on sort of later in the weekend. And yeah, look, another sort of good finish from, from Haider. Um, and so those cup runs, I absolutely associate with, with Haider Helgerson. The, the Viali season, I'd pretty much forgotten that he played him as a wing back. Yeah, I, I really, I really don't associate Hyder with that season. I think, because, like you say, the, the hoopla season it sort of stands out as an anomaly, just in terms of the players we had and, and the money that was being spent that we didn't have. Um, it was just something completely different to to Watford over that whole sort of period. Um, that almost Hyder isn't a part of it for me, and obviously he wasn't as heavily involved as he would like to have been, and when he was it wasn't in the position he would have liked to have been. But I've, I've almost disassociated the two. Um, Hyder is, for me, very much about what sort of followed after. And again, some some seasons were a struggle. Um, the cup runs perhaps gloss over. Certainly the League Cup run probably glosses over his last season in that first stint with us. When, when yeah, Good run to the, to the League Cup. Great games against uh, Southampton and Portsmouth. But, but my... Um, I think another abiding memory of Heide Helgerson is Ray Lewington gone. We, we get getting towards the business end of the season. There were a lot of teams, if I remember rightly, sort of milling around, fighting against relegation. And we weren't completely safe with two games to go. And we had Stoke away. And, and I went to that game um, under Eddie Boothroyd. And again, I think it was a 1-0 on Heide scored the winner. Big scenes of celebration in the in the away end and I jumped up and down so much that I lost my keys out of my pocket and oh. landed in the <laughs> row behind so I had to yeah, sort of the, the, the person behind me I, I didn't realize the person behind sort of tapped me on the shoulder Are these yours um <laughs> and again it's just silly things like that that sort of stuck with me for today but that was that was Heide Helgson scoring a very important goal because had we lost that game we then went on to lose West to, to West Ham in the final game of the season I think it was we wouldn't have had enough points to stay up we, we could well have been relegated it was an interesting career that that first, and he did suffer with injury, didn't he? And he didn't like mm. so many players we've seen over the years. You do wonder what would have happened had he been able to stay completely free of injury. And I guess we've already potentially alluded to the fact why why he suffered with with injury, just throwing himself around like some sort mm. of um, well, a lunatic at times in the best possible sort of professional way perhaps that that put a strain on him and he and he did end up with with more injuries than than perhaps a less full-blooded player and I think it, it felt like on occasions he he lacked a little bit of confidence and I suspect with the tumult that was going on around Watford during that that spell it's probably not massively surprising relegated in the in the Premier League thrown in as a striker in the Premier League, in a, in a struggling side, it's, it, it's, it's very, very difficult. We've, we've seen um, this season how Rajovic has come in from from the, the, the Swedish League, which is obviously different to the Championship and has, has taken time to, to adapt. Well, Ida had to come uh, from Lillestrom, didn't he, and, and react to, to the Premier League. And that, that's no mean feat. He, he obviously took to it well. Then there was changes in, in managers, then he had that change in position, the changes in um, in Watford's situation over the over the course of the that, that four or five years, so it was probably a really really difficult time to be around the club. So to have sort of fluctuating confidence, not not a, a massive surprise, but I think overall it felt like his Watford career, certainly that first it was a was an upward curve. I think um, looking back, he was you were always delighted to have him on the pitch. You were, we always talk about how we want people to go out, tread out, step over that white line when they've got the Watford badge on and to give their, give their all. And, and, and you knew he was going to do that. You knew he was going to be battling for Watford. You knew he was going to be performing for us. And you knew he had the, the ability to, to make something happen. That enormous leap that, that would take uh, defenders by, by surprise. Um, you just knew what you were going to get. But I just felt that as time went on, we... We realised what a good footballer he he was. He had a he had a really good touch, scored with his left, scored with his with his right, and and it just felt like he we appreciated more and more as that as that time went went on, culminating in that that last season of that spell where I think he scored most of his goals. And I think it was that last season, wasn't it? That was the League Cup run, 
mm, where we yeah. beat Portsmouth and Southampton, who I think were both in the Premier League yeah, at the were, yeah. at the time. And that goal he scored against Southampton, we you know we absolutely took apart both of those sides under the lights at at Vicarage Road. Hugely memorable games. But the ball came in, it was whipped in from the right and, and Hyde was on the sort of left-hand angle of the, the penalty box and he he steered it with the instep, instep of his, his right foot into the, um, into the corner of the goal. It was the most sublime finish. And we, you know, we've talked about Hyde's sort of physical attributes and the way he, he was made sure he was first to the ball, but that wasn't what he was about necessarily all the time. His touch was absolutely brilliant and his finishing was... It's exactly what you want from a from a striker. He could absolutely melt it into the back of the net, but he also had this this wonderful touch as well. And that that Southampton goal for me is one that you know if I if I close my eyes and think of Hyder, that's what I think. And I remember the the pandemonium pandemonium in the uh, in the rookery that night. It was we were in the in the Championship and languishing a bit, and the fact that we were sticking it to these Premier League um, teams with the help of Hyder Helgeson was was really good and he felt like at the at the vanguard of that it was um, yeah it felt like we were doing it together with him if that makes sense yeah i mean you're right that you know a player like him and the, you know the way he the goals he scored at the time he scored you know the, the celebration losing your keys jason uh you know it was really sort of raucous really sort of you know energetic and uh in some ways sparse i suppose but um he of course not only did he play crazy he did celebrate a little bit crazy michael because uh, of course he he tried to do a nice celebration, but but fell over a billboard. Yeah, and now I was tr- I can't work out if he if the billboard gave what it was in front of the rookery, wasn't it? And he yeah, uh, it's a bit like Wesley Hurt in the game against uh, Hull a couple of weeks ago, where he ran the full distance of the um of the pitch to celebrate in front of the Watford fans, jumped onto the perimeter hoardings and saluted the away fans. Well, Hyder tried to do something similar after a goal, and I think he basically slipped off. Um, but it's, it's so typical with Hyder, he sort of styled it out. And it felt like, yep, yeah, that's typical Hyder Helgeson. What an absolute legend. And uh, whereas some players, you might have laughed at them a little bit for it and found it a little bit embarrassing. For for us and Hyder, it just felt like, yeah, that's the sort of thing that we would have probably done as a if we'd scored a goal celebrating for, for Watford. And it just felt, it just enhanced that, that connection, I think, with us as, as supporters. It's like, yes, there's our man doing his stuff out there, doing the sort of stuff that we do. And just that that link with the with the supports he forged was sort of yeah, that summed it up. And I think if you say cult hero or terrace hero, he is never ever far away from from the lips of Watford supporters, largely due to to, to memorable incidents like that. There is one more little move that I used to like that he did. He had this uncanny knack when the ball was on the floor, and if he sort of racing towards the keeper, they seem to be able to knock it past him and then change direction and run into the keeper and win a penalty. I think he did that on more than one occasion. I don't know if that's just me, but yeah, that, that I've got that stuck in my head for him as well. Super canny footballer, really, mm. really good feet and really, really good finishing. Like I say, people will remember the Liverpool goal. We've talked about it, but his, you know, his touch and like you say, Jake, his, his body movement and the way he was able to move the ball to manoeuvre the ball to where he needed it to be or to, like you say, to, to, to win the penalty. Brilliant. What, what a player he was for us. What a player. I mean, he also, for me, he sits in those players that I, I have a lot of respect for, uh, Jason, with, particularly because of the financial problems we had and the pay cuts they would have taken. And, you know, they, I'm not to say this, we're not the same sort of place as football is now, but you know, there could have been easily move away, get a move, take the money. But they sort of did, you know, he was one of those players that did sort of stick around and did what was needed, I suppose, to keep our club alive. And, you know, him... Neil Ardley and Neil Cox, they you know, they all really feel like players, as well as others, of course, they feel like players that, that did the club right, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we sort of talk about this period in, in Watford history. You can you sort of, I guess it's sort of bookended by a couple of Premier League appearances and you sort of associate that whole era sort of following the ITV digital collapse. It, we knew we were in sort of financial trouble. Um, and once you're on that slippery slope, it is very hard to get out of. So that whole period, you, you, you sort of associate with money problems. And for those players, especially with, with someone like Heide Helgson, who, as we've already said, is such a good player, it would have been easy for them to sort of say, well, no, this is this wasn't what I was sold when I came to the club. Came to the, the club as a, as a Premier League player. Now I'm yeah having to, yeah, 
on on cut wages, reduced wages, playing at the level a level lower than uh, I came into. It would been quite easy for them to sort of look elsewhere. Obviously, offers did come in in the end, and we had to take the opportunity to to sell him to Fulham when we did. I guess there's a chance that he could have gone earlier if he really wanted to, but he didn't. Um, his return, though, Mike, you talk about like his absolute what sums Hyder up. I think his return, his debut return uh, against <laughs> Leicester, it was 3-3. He came on, he scored two goals, then he got injured and he went off. And he was then injured for a good couple of games after. He's back on loan from QPR. But that you could almost, again, that performance, seeing him play, knowing that, you know, if you look at the stats and stuff, he was not in a good place. And as he says later on, he wasn't enjoying life at QPR. And it was almost like he was like, right, I'm back. I want this. I want to do well. And I'm going to score goals. And he did score goals alongside that Danny Graham and Tommy Smith that season. But that game, come on, score, get injured, off you go. <laughs> it, yeah, that, yeah, that his, energy. His, 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 maybe perhaps like his career in, in microcosm, sort of come on, make a really big impact, um, do what he's paid to do, which is which is score goals and then unfortunately have that have that curtailed with with an injury but i think that goes back to what to what jace was was saying about him being a good bloke and a good a good player for Watford because i think he just got it i think he understood what the place was about i think he understood what we were about as fans i think he understood what Watford were probably fighting for or or the, what level they were battling at at that stage and he just he just understood it and just wholeheartedly worked at it. And I think he, my take was that he enjoyed playing in a Watford shirt. And I think that that shone through in that when he when he came back, he he didn't look like he'd been gone. It didn't look like he'd been away, really. And I think he he probably felt that as well. And yeah, to make make that impact against <laughs> against Leicester was. Um, was absolutely superb, and of course we managed to um, to make. To, I think we got him to the end of the season, didn't we? We extended yeah. the yeah. loan through to the to the end of the season because he was he was struggling a little bit at QPR, but then went on after that to 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 do pretty well again. And to, it was the the, the high that we we know and love. And I think we were all a bit felt a bit sad that that he'd left and we weren't able to to keep him on. But again, understood that because. We were where we were at, and and Hyder was where where he was at. But yeah, that I think that Leicester game is 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 one that will will live in the memory as well. Just just came on and did exactly what he's supposed to do, which is terrorise the opposition uh, and score goals for the Golden Boys. Yeah, and Jay's that season he sort of came back as a senior player in many ways because Danny Graham had had joined that summer, done all right. He scored that. He did score goal in the in that return debut for for Hyder. But him and Tommy Smith coming back just added that sort of seniority uh, to that side, at that very young side that we had. Uh, and he he just added a lovely, again, like you say, Mike sort of says there, Jace, he sort of says that idea of comfort and familiarity um, that he added to, to that. What do you think about his return and that, that season for you? Interesting, because I, I missed that Leicester game. You know, I, I was a weekend away, but sort of trying to keep... Um tabs on sort of on the game so i think i was cycling around hills somewhere um with sort of mates from from university so i, I missed that and it, it it felt like a not a missed opportunity but i missed out on a, on a good exciting game and it was yeah very clearly um the return of hyder with the two goals and then of course the uh the injury for the rest of the season like you say it was quite a, a young side i think there was some old Heads yeah, in there as well. If I remember rightly, we had um, some lone players in. Uh, one, one Tom Cleverley. One Tom Cleverley, who's still at the club. One um, Henry Lansbury as well, who uh, uh, who may have gone on to uh, sully his reputation somewhat by going elsewhere further on in his career. <laughs> um, but but those those two guys put in a a, a good shift for us and it's a sort of good good season for us um, as well. And uh, so we had a, it felt like we had a nice balance, but yeah, Hyder would have been very much a, an important part of that. And again, as you say, he was he was scoring goals again. He, like Mike said he'd had he'd, I think he'd struggled a bit. He obviously had been at Bolton, didn't work out for him there. Then gone to to QPR on loan, and and had, I think he'd struggled at the start of that season after joining them permanently, if I remember rightly. So I suppose it was a little bit of a surprise that he came back, but. Like you say, it's almost like the, the the bad times for him of the recent seasons have been forgotten, and he started scoring goals again. 
Um, Went on for yeah. two more promotions. Uh, another yeah. year, approached with QPR the following year, a year in the Premier League, moved to Cardiff and another promotion. He, he was just, it, it revitalised him. Exactly, as I was going to say. It's almost like we did we did them a favour because it, it just seemed to kickstart his career. And when he, the following season, when he, um, he sort of finished his loan with us and went back to, to QPR under under Neil Warnock when they won the title, didn't they, that, that season with some good players. Hyder was very much a part of that. And then I think Cardiff, when, again, winning promotion, he was, he was quite an old man by footballer standards at that age, but still, again, made a good contribution. We're going to hear now from Sir Nigel Gibbs, uh, a man who's been who was around Watford for, for decades. Um, and we want to find out a little bit from Nigel about what he was like to... Hyder was like around the training ground and, and what he was like um, in terms of well, everything really on, the, on, on and off the pitch. So this is what uh, Mike and I spoke to uh, Sir Nigel a couple of weeks ago uh, to find out about about Hyder. But I started asking Nigel to, about what what the place was like at that point in uh, 1999 slash 2000. You know, you still look back and remember things and it was a very difficult sort of season in many ways because we didn't have the finances to compete and we, we weren't able to bring many players of Premier League experience in and, and, and that eventually cost us. I mean, we lost so many games by the odd goal that season and we just weren't quite good enough so we couldn't turn that draw into a win or that loss into a draw and, and, and that was sort of how it went. I mean, I ended up playing, I think I made 16 appearances that season in the Premier League but uh, as you say, we had injuries to key players so it was very, very difficult. And it, I think looking back now, it was it was very difficult for the club to sort of bring that better quality of player and then to keep that spirit of the players that, that got us those two promotions. And it's always a balancing act. And uh, having been in the, on the coaching side for many years now, I, I know how difficult that is. But as you say, it was a tough season and, um, you know, lo- losing a couple of players for long-term injuries, it, it, it wasn't easy. So Hyder came in, he was a, a million and a half Quinn, any Watford supporter can put their hand on the heart and say they'd, they'd heard of him. What was the reaction to, to the news of his signing when, when that came through to the, to, the, to the dressing room? I sort of follow football when, when I was a player, but you know I, I hadn't heard of Hyder before. And obviously I knew he came from Lidlstrom. 1.5 million was a, was a big outlay for the football club. You know, I don't know if it was a, the record fee at the time. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, for, OK. Um, but always you sort of trusted the boss's <laughs> scouting of players and, and definitely needed a striker because in the Premier League you, ha- you have to score goals and when you get those few chances you have to take them. So brilliant we were bringing the player in but obviously we didn't, we didn't know anything about him you know, and that was, uh, you know, we're going to see how he, how he coped with the Premier League because it was obviously a, you know, his first time in, 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 in England. It's easy to forget how close that, that Watford side was it was it was on a real crest of a wave going up through the through the divisions back back to back player coming in big price tag record price tag replacing not replacing but coming in to score the goals that Tommy was scoring how did he sort of announce himself in the in the dressing room what was he what was he like as a, a bloke Firstly, he had a good start because he scored on his debut, didn't he, against Liverpool? Yeah, so that was uh, a, a good way of uh, settling in. But straight away, I mean, he probably only had a couple of days training before that Liverpool game and then, and then he scored. But y- you soon saw what attributes he had. It fitted him really well, bubbly character. But training-wise was, was the key because you always judge people in the, in, on the training field. And he, he was exactly the same as he was on the pitch. He gave 100% every day. You know, full on in training. You saw his attributes, full of energy. As a character, really, really good, humble guy. So he he fitted in straight away well to to the group we had. There was a couple of other players probably didn't fit in as well, but certainly for for Hyder, he obviously settled very quickly and uh, became part of the group very, very quickly. And, and and once you've scored that goal, that settles him down. We obviously struggled that season. I think he maybe got maybe five, six, seven goals that season and probably not as many as he would have liked. And, but he settled into the squad really well and fitted in really well. How quickly did you all realise that he could defy gravity? That was the other thing. I mean, there was a, I mean, someone for his height, he had the, the best spring I've ever known. You know, he, he was incredible in the air. I mean, he, he wasn't six foot, but he could jump, you know, and he was very brave. 
like, OK, whenever you get the chance to put the ball in the box, you better because you know you've got someone who's going to attack it. And, and that became quite evident early on. And, uh, you know, over his Watford career and his career elsewhere, you saw him score many good goals with his head because, you know, he had such a great leap. Yeah, absolutely unbelievable. You mentioned what he was like in, in training as well, Nigel, full, full heart, full blooded, whole hearted. I think I read somewhere that there was a, a rumour doing the rounds that they had to make sure that him and Jay Demerit were on opposite sides or on the same side in, in trailing um, because they, they'd smash into each other otherwise. Is there any, any, any truth in that? I cannot conf confirm or deny, but they definitely didn't play together much <laughs> in small-sided games. Um, they, I mean, Jay, Jay was the same. I mean, um, Jay was a 100% player and I, I was like that myself. I couldn't be anything but 100%, so I really like those type of players even now, you know, because I can associate with those and both Jay and, and, and Hyder, you know, they, they were terrific and, and they could only play one way. You know, that was their strengths and that's probably why they had the careers they did. You know, if you give everything on the training pitch and, and you're competitive, that, that's what you want as a coach and that's what you want as other players. So, you know, he, he became very popular early on, Hyder, because of his, his, his commitment, you know, without a doubt. You sort, of, you sort of straddled his career quite nicely. You, were, you played with him, as you mentioned, and also you were sort of on the coaching staff while he was there as well, weren't you? How... Because obviously, to us as supporters, we we loved him because of everything you've described. So wholehearted, he would he would rough up defenders, he would chip in, chip in with goals. But it he sort of does strike me as a slightly potentially more complicated character than just turn up and give it full throttle. Because the second year, he he was he struggled a bit, didn't he? He was he just didn't score as many goals. And I think I saw somewhere he said that that Graham got stuck into him a little bit. Is that? Was that down to confidence with him? Was he was he a bit more fragile than than perhaps fans might have thought? I think we all are at times, but certainly as a striker, if you're not scoring goals, it, it does affect you, and it's very difficult for strikers to overcome that at times because sometimes it's not your fault because you're not getting the service, you might not get the ball in in the box at the right time or that through ball, so it it, it can affect you. But I think. With, with Heider, he, he cared so much and that was the big thing. I think that's probably why his confidence maybe was affected at times. But I think it wasn't really until, you know, Ray Lou took over and I was on the coaching side then and, and actually really backed him and supported him and um, played to his strengths that you, you saw the best of him. And I think he'd probably say that himself, you know, but uh, it's very difficult for strikers. It, it really is. And uh, as you say, he probably on the outside looked yeah tough Icelandic boy, but, you know, underneath he, he, he cared. And that, that's probably why sometimes he, you know, his confidence may be wavered. Is that quite rare? I mean, I know I know footballers take take pride. They have professional pride. You don't get to that level yeah. if you if you aren't, aren't fully committed. But Caring about the caring is something that means a lot to us as supporters. Obviously, we invest a lot of time and money and effort, and you want you want to see the badge represented. Do you think he was someone that you know he stood out in that in, in that regard as is just wanting to do the best for his club? Is that is that fair? And how rare is that? Yeah, no, I I hundred percent agree. I think that uh, there was never a game you, you you would say, well, I'm not sure he was really at it today. He might not have had a, the best game in the world, but. He, he he gave 100% and, and that's why probably he's so popular with the fans because it, he, he was that player and you can't play well every week, you know, you but you can still work hard every week and, and that's what he did and I think that was his, his biggest strength and then obviously he had his qualities and, you know, I think probably the last season um, he maybe got 20 goals and I, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, because... Um, that's the type of player he is because he will improve as well because he wanted to improve but he cared um, and... I think that was, you know, one of his biggest assets, you know. You know, seeing him under Graham, seeing him under Ray Lou, but also seeing him under Viali. I mean, he he was basically, if you look at the, the graphs and stuff, he just seemed to be a substitute that year. Mm -hmm. So he didn't quite get the love, but he did when he played, he did score goals. Does that, do you think that, you know, did you see anything different of him that season? We did get, we did get one message from a fan sort of saying at the end of season dinner that year, he looked really grumpy because he hadn't really been playing. Um, did, did you feel that, did, that, did you see a different side of him at all under, under Viali? Uh, or was everything different? It was, it was all, yeah, it, it was all different because it was trying to play a different style of football. And uh, like every professional I know, they want to play. So he wanted to play every week. He wanted to play as a striker. And if you're not playing, you're not going to be ha happy. So um, that probably was what 
people maybe saw at the end of the season because it was a frustrating season for us all. And then come pre-season and it changes again, it gives you a new sort of, OK, we're, we're off again now. I know Ray Lewington, I, I like Ray Lewington, I want to play for him. And that's no disrespect to, to Luca because sometimes it just doesn't work out with a manager, does it? So, But it's never easy when you're not playing. And, and I, I think... You know, we, we saw that when, when Hyder became the regular under Ray Lewington that uh, you, you, you saw probably his best season, one of his best seasons, you know? Do you think potentially, Nigel, striker is the ultimate confidence p- position? Because when you're playing as a defender, you're, you're busting your, your balls to keep the ball out of the net. Then yep. you need the, the striker to go and do the business at the other end. So you're, you're relying on him. And when mm-hmm. you're on the coaching side of things, obviously the, the name of the game is to, is, to, is to score goals and you need your striker to, to finish them at the end of the day. So do, do you think there is a... Uh, was it, did Hyder find that difficult? Do you think that... Well, is that true, that level of expectation? And do you think Hyder find that, found that, that tough to, to get to grips with? I think, you know, every striker is judged on his goals, but I think, you know, as a coach now and, and from the other side of it, you, you want more than, you know, you know you're going to have to have more than scoring goals. Scoring goals is the icing on the cake and what you judge on, but his work rate, so you're defending from the front, uh, you know, you're creating for other people, you're defending both box, you know, you're defending the box and, and then trying to score on the other one. So there's there's more to the game, but because you're judged on goals, then, you know, it's it, it, it can be quite difficult. But again, as I spoke, you know, alluded to it earlier on that you rely on the service as well. You know, you need the service, you need the ball in the box at the right, you know, so he can make his runs and, you know, get, get across his defender or run in behind, whatever it is. So you are relying on other people to create and score, you know, create chances for you. And then, then it's up to you to score the goals. So, uh, you know, it'd be really interesting, uh, and I haven't done it, but uh, for high there, you know, what is his, you know, shots to goal ratio? Because he might not have had many chances and, and, and scored quite a lot of goals from the chances he got, you know, or he might have had a lot of chances and didn't, you know, you just don't know. But, you know, certainly as a, as a striker, you, 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 need, you need other parts of your game to do well. And I think if he didn't score, you knew that he would cause problems to the opposition he would chase things down his work rate was phenomenal you know it it do other things for the team and uh, uh, as I say that they those players are, are invaluable let me tell you you so you were, you were still on the staff in his last season weren't you so was there a thing about when you know that last season with, with Ray and then AD came yeah. in right at the end was there a thing about actually it was time for him to move on because he'd come to Watford as this, you know, he never had any experience in, in England. He'd spent f- five years, whatever it was, at, with, with Watford. Do you feel that actually there was a lot of, yeah, it, it's Hyde is going to be going this summer or, or yeah, did it seem right time for it? Um, I'm not sure, John, to be honest, because I obviously left in that summer as well. And um, obviously AD had come in and, you know, maybe he decided that that was the decision, you know, I, I wasn't privy to that. So... I, I don't know is the answer. You know, when you've scored 20 goals, people are going to be showing an interest in you as well, aren't they? So you just don't mm. know, you know, whether it was the club's decision or whether it's actually the bid was too hot. I, I, I don't know. But as soon as you start scoring 20 goals a season, you, you're going to be wanted or, you know, it's going to be, you know, a contract that's going to be better than the one you're on. So there, there could have been a couple of sort of uh, things that were, 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 you know, reasons for him moving on. That's why we're glad you only scored five or six, uh, Nigel. Because I think we got, we got we got to hang on to you, which is. Uh, really... Can I just say there was it was seven. <laughs> well, seven. I, I teed you up for that. That was a, a cross for your own little tap in there. Thank you very much. Because after, after Watford, he did. He was a Premier League player. He played at Fulham. He played at Bolton. He played at QPR. You know, it, it was that was I, for me. It wasn't a surprise. But did you think it was a surprise for for football? I suppose that he he did keep a career, you know a good career going in the premier league after what was only 6 months with watford really in the premier league before he played for us you know pretty much in the championship or the tier 2 yeah i think you know because of the things i spoke about his other attributes to his game as well as his goals maybe you know that was why people were and signed him and obviously kept on playing in the Premier League because they're hard to come by. They're hard to come by, you know. So, you know, sometimes you get, well, he can score goals, but he doesn't really contribute much to the team if he's not scoring goals, whereas Hyder contributed a lot to the team and and could score goals. You know, he had spells where he, you know, would, would go on runs and score goals. So that I'm, I'm not surprised that to, to managers and coaches liked him and bought him and, um, and and he did stay in the Premier League because, that, you know, as I spoke, that, that those attributes are a few and far between, you know. 
Have you got a, just to finish off, unless John's got anything else, but just to finish off, have you got a favourite on-field moment with with Hyder? Mine, mine was when he, he celebrated, he jumped on the um, advertising hoarding and the advertising hoarding collapsed under underneath him. I thought that summed up the chaos that, that Hyder brought to things pretty pretty well. Have you got a favourite on-field moment with, with Hyder and a famous off and, and a favourite off-field moment that we might not have heard of or known? I suppose he, his celebrations were, uh, he was so pleased to score, wasn't he? Whenever he was, I was thinking that. I mean, I can remember him do a high knee sort of run after scoring a goal and, you know, different ones and like going into the stand. So, I mean, he just loves scoring goals. And I think there's not particular one thing. The, the other thing is that um, Hyder and I were, were keen golfers. So he never played golf, but he became obsessed with golf when he came over to, to England. <laughs> And uh, he used to play regularly and uh, obviously we kept in touch when, when I'd finished playing and he'd moved on to other clubs and I'd been elsewhere. And uh, myself, him and Alec Chamberlain we went actually up to St Andrews to play golf for a weekend together. And uh, so he absolutely loved his golf and he would wear his plus fours. He would have the, <laughs> if you could imagine a, an old golfer in Scotland, uh, um, that is Hyder. So he would take it literally. So he would have the plus fours, the cap, the outrageous colours. Um, and so that, that was always a good memory. I mean, he, he loved his golf and he got obsessed with it. And uh, I spent many a good time on the golf course with him. Was he was his hectic and passionate about his golf or did you see a different side of him when he played golf no he was exactly he was <laughs> obsessed he was obsessed with golf and he would practice and he would get annoyed if he wasn't so he wanted to be the best golfer he could be and and that sort of was the same as him as a footballer wasn't it mm. he gave everything on the pitch and on that golf course he wanted he would have lessons he would do everything bear in mind he never played golf before he no. came to England so he was obsessed with it and uh, I know actually when he was at Fulham um, he, he became a member of Wentworth and I went round and played golf with him round there. He was obsessed with it, so uh, um, you know, good memories of, of, of time. And obviously, Alec was uh, a keen golfer as well, so we enjoyed a great weekend up at St Andrews playing golf. Good there, Mike, to hear like you know, almost like Sir Nigel backing things up about all our feelings about Hyder. Firstly, can I say well, this is obviously a podcast dedicated to, to Hyder, and I think I think he is a Watford legend for me, Hyder Helgus, and he, mm. he definitely fits that fits that bracket. But what an incredible man Nigel Gibbs is. What an absolute joy to speak about. Apart from you insulting him about the number of goals he's scored, Michael. Yeah, well, that, I was, I was, that was basically a backhanded sort of ego massage for him to tell me how many he did actually, he did actually score. Um, but yeah, the way that Nigel Gibbs speaks so warmly about, about Watford is, is so rewarding. There's that, fa- that famous phrase, never meet your heroes. Well, meeting Nigel Gibbs or talking to Nigel Gibbs is, is nothing but an absolute pleasure. So thank you. Um, to Sir Nigel for for giving up his time and and I think yeah he he speaks calmly and eloquently about Hyder and and yeah it, it reaffirms everything that we 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 thought about the man what what did change slightly was that when I picture Hyder Helgus and I see either that Southampton goal um, him sort of bullying the the Liverpool defence or as we mentioned earlier falling off the hoarding in front of the um, in front of the uh, the rookery end. Now, um, I have to add to that in my sort of mental um, image bank of uh, of Hyder Helgeson is him in plus fours. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in, yeah, in starting full it regalia. It was uh, fantastic, you know, to hear Nigel, and it was well, it was uh, it was hard uh, when I actually spoke to Hyder because he was in he's back in Iceland. It was a Sunday night, and uh, we were having technical problems, all the rest of it. But we got we got connected, and it was a little bit different and uh, distant, shall I say? But you'll hear it now, where we got I got to sit down and have a chat to Hyder. He definitely comes across as you're sort of here as someone who who doesn't have the memory, doesn't remember the details. I can sort of uh, I can feel that a little bit myself. Uh, not like Jason, who remembers all the the stats and stuff. But it's, uh, this is what Hyder had to say about his time at Watford. Of course, we go through all the, the, the eras and the managers that he sort of played under. Uh, but uh, this is our interview with Mr. Hyder Helgerson. <laughs> or Nigel Gibbs, or Sir Nigel Gibbs as we call him. When we spoke to him on Friday, he said you got quite obsessed with one thing in particular when you came to England. And that was golf. He said you love playing golf. Is that right? Yes, it is. I played quite a bit once I was there. Before I arrived, I sort of hiddled a little bit with it. 
fit it in well with the football, I suppose. And obviously, Alec and Kipo and Coxie and then played. And eleven, I still play. I can say, do you still you still have a you still play with it a lot? You know, obviously, the season here, the following season here is four months. <clears throat> can I start by asking again? Like, so when you came over to England, how did that come about? Was it something that you had been pushing for, or was it a bit of a surprise for you? Not pushing, but uh, I was in Norway at the time playing for Lillestrøm. In my second season there, I did fairly well. Knew of of interest from teams, not in England, but in France and elsewhere. So I knew I was going to go somewhere. But uh, as soon as you know Watford came in, that was really never any other option. Because in, in Iceland, English football is massive. It was always a dream rather than something else to play in England. So when the when the opportunity came, you know, there wasn't really any other option. Well, you know, didn't really want to go anywhere else. And with, with that, was it the fact that was Watford the big at all a big draw? Did Graham play a role in maybe making it an easy choice for you? I would love to say that it make a difference, but it was if I'm being honest, it was it was the only team in England that came in obviously knew about Watford and you know Elton John and Graham Taylor. So knew about them, but it wasn't really that I wanted to particularly come to Watford. You know, but I'm really happy I did. But and, and you joined it was at one one point five million when you joined, which at that point was the highest it Watford ever paid for a player. Did you did that sort of price tag or that sort of status Way on your mind? Or was it a thing that was talked about or you thought about? Not really, no. I never really thought about it, to be honest. And I suppose the way I started this season and played in the, you know, the second part of the Premier League season that I came, you know, wasn't really, I, you know, did fairly well. It wasn't really something that was on my mind. I can't remember it ever, ever being mentioned. And when you, you turned up, say, halfway through the season, you score one against Liverpool on your first game. You score the following week. Um, but Watford was sort of struggling, I suppose, in the Premier League. How did that feel to be around the club and, and coming into the club at that point? It was just fantastic. It, you know, I never really noticed that, uh, you know, obviously on the pitch and, you know, looking at the table and stuff, you noticed that, you know, we were rock bottom and stuff. But, you know, it was just so much adrenaline and, you know, stuff going on with me personally that I didn't really pay any attention to it. I was just, you know, literally just on cloud nine, having made it over, over to England. In terms of fans, there's two things we adored about you as a, as a footballer. Firstly, your work rate, how hard you worked. And the other one, and it's still, it, I remember when you, when you returned, how much it sort of, I remember just how amazing your ability to jump really high. Uh, and to head a ball was just extraordinary compared to you know, someone of your, your stature. Were those natural skills that you had, or did you work on them? They were never really intentionally worked on. I played basketball until I was about 15, 16, and I'm pretty sure that helped. But it's just something that I've always, you know, always had. Nothing I particularly worked on or, you know, with regards to the running and the work rate it's, it's just something you know that I always had even when I was younger I was always running around everywhere there was no real conscious effort into practicing the timing of the jumps or anything else it's just something that I had and I think that you know the basketball played a part in that and did you find you changed you know you did you change much as a footballer when you came to England do you have to change anything yes and no I had to improve on a, on a few things, playing or as a target striker or something. There was a few things I had to learn and develop. You know, the way I played for the majority of my career was pretty much how I've always been. Later years, I was more of a you know target striker, less running the channels and stuff. But I think that was, you know, just old age. <laughs> We, we, both you and I are a similar age. I'm about two, only two years younger than you, um, so um, I understand. I understand the feeling a bit older. Um, yeah. <laughs> stuff that happens. Talked about it already, but in terms of that debut, scoring at home against Liverpool, did it? Did that seem like a dream come true? The fact that you had scored against you know a, a worldwide club on your debut. 
Oh, absolutely. I've been a Liverpool supporter all my life. All right. It was ironic that we played them in the in the first game, and uh, you know, to be able to score on your on your debut and play reasonably well. Unlucky we didn't win, but for me personally, it, it was just a dream debut, apart from the loss. Yeah, and of course, score the following week as well. But just uh, yeah, settle things down, I suppose. Bradford away. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. I was looking up. I was yeah, looking yeah. up on the on the archive, just sort of trying to figure it out and go, yes, make sure I could. Yeah, my memory is going and all the rest of it. So just make sure I could remember things correctly. Um, in in terms of that that time, that's you know that you know the first the end of that season and then the following season with Graham. What was he like as a manager? You know, we see him as you know the the greatest manager Watford ever had over the two spells he had. For you, how what was it like uh, working with Graham? Obviously, very good. I don't think I appreciated him enough at the time. Young second season for me didn't really go particularly well. I came back a little bit overweight. I got injured in pre season and I never really got going. And, you know, he had a few well chosen words to me from time to time during that season that I didn't really take too well at the time. But as I got older and matured, I realized he was correct. <laughs> in everything and I really enjoyed my time after while he was the manager even though I just caught the latter years of his career yeah apart from that sort of so him being a bit uh, uh you know straightforward and straight to the line in terms of your your fitness and stuff was there any what was your favorite do you have a favorite moment you had with him my favorite moment was it was it was after a game I can't remember who it was it was uh Elton John came into the dressing room and, and presented him with a mask of beating image. Oh, yes, yeah. He bought his mask at an auction somewhere <laughs> and uh, presented him with it. <laughs> and that was, uh, you know, that's the one I, I, I remember. I, so long ago, I, I get all the years mixed up, 20-odd years. Yeah, it is, yeah, absolutely, I know what you mean. But the, the following year, when Graham left, the Viala year... That season, I'm sure, is in your memory for, for very different reasons. Because he played you at fullback, at wing back almost at one point, didn't he? He did, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I remember that well. So what, how was that? You know, for us as fans, it was a massive change. It must have been huge for you as, as players, as well as all the players that came in. In terms of you know, that season, how was that for, from your point of view? Well, you know, I've, I've found him and Ray Wilkins really pleasant, fantastic lads. You know, it's maybe strange, you know, to hear or say that, you know, I quite enjoyed my time, you know, that year, even though I didn't play as much as I wanted or in the in the positions, you know, but football is uh, it's about personal opinions. And, you know, he obviously didn't fancy me up front, you know, but it was a good experience. OK, that's 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 lovely to know. You know, it, it wasn't a, a successful one, but, you know, I quite enjoyed that time oh that's 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 amazing to know uh, i just didn't think i didn't think that was what i didn't think you'd say that about that season because you say be playing out of position and and you basically sub but coming on fairly regularly as, as a sub when you were i mean if you would have spoken to me then possibly you might have had different opinions yeah different view on things but looking back now and i've you know never had any any you know ill feeling or anything towards them or or that season really and then when when Ray Lou came in um you know we chat to, to to Nigel about it how you know you, you know you all of a sudden you almost found your feet again um and were playing you know so much better how was he as a manager how did he how did he help you he basically believed in me that you know I tended to play my best when I knew that the manager liked me yeah and you know, I don't, I don't think I'm any different from anyone else. You know, but this season before, I had played quite a few reserve matches under Ray, and uh, our relationship was pretty good. Fantastic man, I, I really, really, really like Ray. And of course, it was during a, a, a financial problematic time at Watford. How was that in terms of the, you know, the changing room and pay cuts and you know Neil Cox having to you know, meet with you players and, and sort things out. And yeah, it was a it was a tough time. But what was it? 
what were your memories of the of the change room at that point when all the tough decisions had to be made? Nothing but good. I think it, you know, looking back on it, I, I think it only affected us in a in a positive way, really. Some of, of my fondest memories are the cup runs yeah. during those years. You know, the Liverpool matches, the Southampton, uh, you know, Portsmouth at home, semi-final runs and all that. So I think it only rallied us, really. Yeah, I mean, it seemed that way. It completely, you know, from the stands, it really did seem that way. Um, yeah, yeah. We, we, you know, when you hear and see press about financial problems, you think the worst. And there were lots of really bad clubs at that point who were, you know, nose diving down the leagues when things went wrong. And it was amazing. We sort of stayed where we did. And I think a big part of it was, you know, the the sacrifices and the changes that you guys made as players. Um, but that that FA Cup, I watched I watched some clips ahead of speaking to you. And there was a moment, there was a header you did at, in lit. I think it was the first couple of minutes against Southampton, and the ball just went. You you head it down. The keeper literally just got it around the post. Those big games. Which one do those stand out for you? And and do you remember? Because of Portsmouth, probably at home, in that cup run. I think. Well, my memory of of the two semi finals were that we were. How should I say this? Is that was maybe a step too far? Is my feeling was that you know we've reached where we're going because I didn't think, remember in those two games that you know we were ever going to win them. Not even a little chance of maybe getting the result that you needed. Obviously beforehand, you know, but how the games played out, I just think that was maybe the end station. I I sort of had the feeling looking back on it is that you know if. We would have scored. They just would have scored again. That's my honest, honest assessment of you know. Obviously, before the games, we were hoping to win. But looking at the games after the game, I think we had reached sort of our limit. Oh, what should I say? Yeah, I understand what you mean. Yeah, reach a ceiling. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, played with so many, many seasons. In terms of that first spell that you had with us, who were the players that you were? Uh, you think you were? closest with or you were the the best players for you either because they they helped you score goals or you helped them score goals or you just they were your closest sort of uh, friends in the in the change room which players do you have fond memories of Alec Gibbo Coxie Neil Adley Tommy Smith I was in contact with Espen Espen Bartson the keeper remember him yeah I was in contact with him for a while Richard Johnson isn't he at uh, the academy. Yeah, no. yeah, he's head of the academy. Yeah, he's he's running that now. So many to mention. Micah Hyde, remember him. But, but in terms of your 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 sort of your first exit from Watford, you know Ray Lew had left. Ad had come in. Did you have conversation with Ad about playing that season, or you know were you always going to be leaving to you know for financial reasons so the club could could get some money from your your selling? What was how did the your sort of your exit play out? AD obviously came at the end of the previous season and I played, I, I can't remember how many games he was charged. Obviously, if there hasn't been any interest, then I would have stayed on. But I think because of the financial problems, someone had to go. There was some interest in me from Wigan and some others. And I was looking to get into the Premier League if and when the opportunity would arise. I'd almost gone to, well, I, I pretty much agreed everything with Wigan when, when Fulham came in. I was up in Wigan pretty much ready to sign when they rang. And then I had to just say no to them and travel down, you know, because I wanted more Fulham than, you know, the Wigan move. Watford needed the money and because there was an interest from the Premier League, I was also interested, you know, to take them up on that interest. What was life like? At, you know, at Fulham and then at uh, it was Fulham and then you went to Bolton and then to Queen's Park Rangers. How did you find that life compared to life at Watford? I liked my time at Fulham. It was similar to Watford, the size of it and stuff, stadiums and, you know, everything else. And I really, really liked it at Fulham. I was 18 months at Bolton, but that didn't work out. I was injured for quite a while and then... Maxon came in as manager, didn't fancy me, so I went on loan to QPR. And the loan went well, and then I signed permanent, and there were so many problems 
behind the scenes and stuff, and I was just playing really badly when the chance to uh, to come back to Watford came up. Well, yeah, how how did that come about? I think I might have rung actually Richard Collins, physio, if I remember correctly. But and how easy was that decision though to to come back at that point? Because you know we weren't in the 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 best place at that point. I think close again to financial problems and possibly going out of out of business. What was the uh, what was the sort of atmosphere in the you know the changing room under under Malky? Because I mean, and again, you scored in your debut too in that three three draw with Leicester, which was just like yeah, I went off injured. Yeah, you did. <laughs> what was the? What, what, how was that? Like the your return, um, and you know, you're almost playing a a completely different role. You were much older, um, and in terms of you know, Danny Graham was there. He sort of started fairly well for us that season. His following year, he had a great season, but then that yeah. year with you, you know, with, with you, did you f- see yourself in a different role at Watford, being a slightly older, experienced pro? Well, you know, it you know didn't disappoint. Absolutely enjoyed my time there again. There was just so much crap going on at QPR yeah, behind the scenes and manager after manager after manager. I, I just didn't like it and, and I wanted to come to Watford. I went to Watford for that nine months or whatever it was and absolutely loved it again. How was that coming back? Yeah, yeah, I playing with Tommy, but also how was it you know, playing with what was a very young team of players who, and Tom Cleverley, of course, who were a very young Tom, Tom Cleverley at that point. What was it like yeah. to play with them? Really good. It was a really good team. And then obviously me and Tommy played at QPR a couple of years after that. So, you know, like I said before, I really enjoyed that long spell. And it, it sort of kicked me on really for the, you know, last few years of, my career because I I wasn't enjoying football at QPR until Warnock turned up. Those nine months at Watford, yeah, really kicked me on again. Yeah, because you you, know, you had a, a great season the following year, you know, winning the the championship, another year in the Premier League, and then another winning season at, at Cardiff. So it did feel like it sort of gave you revitalised you a little bit to 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 make the the, the last few years in England uh, a massive success. Yeah, it did absolutely. And and when you look back now, as your at your both your sort of spells at Watford, and can I ask, like, we as I said, as Watford fans, we absolutely adored you, and you know you're up there with the the biggest names of of in history. When you when you were here and when you were playing, did did you know that we you know we loved how you played football and we loved you wearing a yellow shirt? Did that did that come across to you? It did. I knew I was reasonably well liked. And yes, I did always feel that I was appreciated and loved. I have to say, yeah, I did notice that. Yeah. You know, now you're you're not an old man, but you're older man. How do you look back, and what do you think you you got the most? What what were the the, the most important things that you got from your time uh, as a as a hornet? You know, just the experience and pleasure. I, you know, like I said before, I, looking back, I, I absolutely loved my time all those years at Watford and wouldn't have missed them for the world. And, and if you could have, a, if you could send a message to Watford fans now, what would you like to say to them? Just thanks ever so much for all the support and keep reporting like you've always done. Fantastic. Do you get to watch Watford much? I have been about four times in the last few years. I didn't go much at all, you know, the first few years after I retired. But then in the sort of last four or five years, I've, I've been, I think, four or five times. A podcast made by Watford fans and for Watford fans from the rookery end. Straight off the back of something there, John, I'm going to pick you up on something you said before we played in Hyder talking there. Doesn't remember the detail. Well, I remember as quick as a flash, you mentioned the Liverpool goal and you said, oh yeah, he scored in the next one. Yeah. And before you even finished saying that, he said, yeah, away at Bradford. <laughs> so I think you might have done uh, Mr. Helgeson a little bit of a, a little bit of a disservice there. So he's, uh, yeah, he, he remembers the important stuff, uh, evidently. It's just lovely to hear from him, isn't it? It's like you said, John, sort of listening to that. He's not someone that we thought we'd ever get to speak to. Like you say, he's back in Iceland. And I think the thing that stood out for me is that he does seem to get how much we loved him and appreciated him as as fans. And that probably, that's probably why we were talking before the interview about him hanging around when possibly he 
could have gone if, if sort of other offers had came in sort of during those difficult times. That's probably a big part of it, isn't it? That's probably why he was happy to do so. It, 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 I just thought that came across really well sort of throughout that interview, the, the, how much he appreciated Watford. And sometimes you wonder when players move around, when they're sort of playing for different clubs, and you think of what he achieved. We spoke before about um, winning promotion with GPL, winning promotion with Cardiff. Yet, yeah, as Mike says, there are details that he's picked up in there. He, he clearly loved his time at Watford. He loves the fans, and it's great to hear that. It's quite reaffirming as a Watford fan to hear someone that, that we love and appreciate seems to sort of share that mutually about us as fans. What I thought was extraordinarily lovely was when he talked about joining Watford. He, the way he described coming over to play in England in the Premier League, he described it as a, as a dream. And you could tell by the way he said it, as a literal dream, as, as something that almost like the way we'd look at it. Sort of, oh, one day I'd love to play in the in the Premier League. He almost sort of suggested it as this unattainable thing, as something obviously he worked was working towards, but did he really believe it was ever going to happen? Because it was such a pinnacle, seen as such a pinnacle, and to and to hear him sort of describe ultimately him achieving that that goal was was so so great. It's it's just like the essence of we know we know what we want as 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 sports supporters we want to see our team play well and and win stuff but just to hear what it's actually like for an elite performer to achieve their goal was there was something really really magical about that and the fact that it was Hyder a man who we've grown to love and respect and enjoyed so much watching achieving his dream through Watford sort of with us as part of the of, of the journey just really cemented the relationship, if you like, and made it feel so special. I was so pleased for him, so proud for him, how proud he must have felt to have achieved that goal of, of, of getting the move to, to England. And then in your first game to score against the team you supported with the <laughs> yeah. world watching on. What a, it's just beautiful. And the fact that we're a part of that and the fact that Watford was able to give um, him that and in turn he gave gave Watford b b back so much was I, I, I found I found it quite moving and I just I just loved it I, and it was it just so great to, to hear from him um, and he he sort of speaks with such enthusiasm I think he's quite he was quite honest with you I felt John and he but that's because he's enthusiastic and he felt able to talk about football and his feelings and um, and how it went, and how he he, he said he, you know he said himself he came back a little bit overweight and didn't really agree with with Graham Taylor when he uh, when he was busting his balls a little bit, but then grew to to understand it. And I think that that chat just allowed us to sort of it it said a lot. It it, it gave us a real insight into his career and how he changed and the challenges of uh, of changing a division, which were mentioned earlier, and how he he dealt with that. It was. It was absolutely, absolutely fascinating. I, I thought with loads of loads of lovely little, little detail in there. I loved the, um, I loved his memory about Elton John bringing in um, <laughs> Graham Taylor's spitting image mask. I, I thought he was just going to say oh, it was great to see Elton John. He came in and told us a story about once when he was in a Rolls Royce with the Rolling Stones or something. But what an amazing thing! Then again, a little insight into. The stuff that we don't see about the, the stuff Elton thinks, oh, I'll get that for Graham and, and bring that in. And the, the lads will think that's funny. And it all just helps to build this. We think Watford's magical, right? And we hear stuff like this and we go, Watford absolutely bloody well is magical. We've had some of the most incredible characters associated with our club over the, over the years. And, and just to hear it firsthand from, from someone like Hyder is, yeah, I've said it and I'll say it again, magic. Where does he sit, though, for you, Jason, in the history of Watford? I know it's really hard to sort of say this because you sort of, you know, Luther and Troy are sort of in a, a different place, let's say. But mm. if, if, if I said you top five or top ten, do you think, of strikers that played for Watford? I know, I know he's definitely going to be above Nathan Ellington. But, you know, where do you, where do you think? Is he, is he in your top five? Is he in your top ten strikers of all time? Blimey, that's a, that's a good question. He probably is. Um if I sort of look back over the, the years and think of who else would be in there, I'm, I'm sure we'd be in certainly top 10, 
Possibly, yeah, probably. I just think who who else would be there? Obviously, like Luther and Ross Jenkins would both be in there. I suppose we have to say say Troy. Troy goes in there, doesn't he? And and then he's probably it's probably you mentioned Danny Graham earlier. Mm-hmm. I was, was a big Danny Graham fan. We love him. And then there's sort of other almost sort of cameo type roles of players that you appreciate at the time. Someone like Jerry Armstrong was there when I first started going. Well, in fact, no, just after I I started going to see Watford, he appeared on the scene. Always, always liked him uh, for sort of his brief Watford appearance, and 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 yeah, then you sort of. Can I? I think he probably it a would. Bit. Yeah, please, because because uh, it's it's a difficult question. <laughs> so probably some I older think, than you. <laughs> I think if you watched Watford during the time that Hyder Helgeson played for the Hornets, and you said, "Who's your favourite Watford player?" Yeah, Hyder Helgeson would, without doubt, be in every single conversation. That that was the impact he had on us as as Watford supporters. He was, you know, we've discussed, you know, the career was up and down, there was injury, yada, yada, yada. But you talk about your fan, it's like an emotional reaction, isn't it? It's about a feeling of connection, it's about feeling something. And Hyder always made you feel something, and usually it was pride in the badge. You, you bounced off his obvious dedication to playing for, for the football club. So if you watched Hyder play... And someone asked you, who's your Watford favourite Watford player? I guarantee you virtually every single Watford fan would mention Heider Helgerson. Uh, he, he didn't fail. He couldn't have failed to have just touched the lives of you as a, as a Watford supporter if, you, if you're around in that time. He was, he was just such a great addition to the club. He was fun to watch. He was exciting to watch. He was exhilarating to watch. We've discussed his, the, the way he played, his good touch, his, his finishing... The goals that he came up with, just an absolute joy to to, to behold. And if you could bottle what Hyder had, you could make some very, very good footballers. Thank you very much for listening to podcasts. We love doing something a bit different than just talking about the games all the time. We do love watching the games, of course. But doing something special like this and speaking to someone special like Hyder uh, is one of the wonderful things we get to do on this podcast. Uh, and we really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we hope you have a very Merry Christmas. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. More than welcome. Thank you. Well done, John, for, for speaking to Heidi. He did, uh, he did an absolutely magnificent job. Thank you. And thank you, Jason. Yes, here, here. Well done, John. Uh, thank you. And thanks to Nigel and Hyder, of course. Yes, of course. Sir Nigel. I don't know what you call a lord or a sir in, in, in uh, Iceland, but I'm sure he's got one. Uh, thank you very much to Hyder. We'll be back, of course, with some more uh, chat about Watford and some games that are going on across uh, the festive period. Uh, but thank you very much. And uh, come on, you all. Zah. 